Hi, and welcome to this section of the Differential Equations Tutor. In this section, we're going to start off this DVD course by talking about, conceptually, about second order equations, second order ordinary differential equations, and equations of higher order. So what we're really going to do in this section, we're going to get into a few examples. We're going to talk about physical system that would really yield a second order differential equation. And we did talk about this uh, briefly in the beginning of the last volume of differential equations tutor when we talked about f is equal to ma. And that's really a second order uh, ordinary differential equation. And so that's sort of what we're going to talk about here, but we're going to choose a different example that's going to illustrate how these second order equations can get more complicated pretty quickly. And so I'm just sort of trying to do this not so that we can solve a bunch of problems in this section and getting all the way to the answer. I'm really doing this to kind of give you an application, an everyday real life application to how a slightly more complicated second order equation can pop up and to kind of illustrate why they're a little bit harder to solve than you might think initially. Okay, so let's start to do that. So what you need to do is think back to your physics one, right? You have a spring right with a stiffness to it attached to a wall and it's attached on the other end to a block of mass m and you know that if this guy is sitting here and you pull that block back and let him go he's going to oscillate right so we studied that somewhat when you took your basic physics physics classes so let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit more we'll start with a simple system and we'll add layers of complexity and see how the differential equation changes just so you can get a flavor for what this stuff's really going to be used for in the remainder of this uh, course, okay? So, what we're going to do first is do exactly what, what we talked about. We're gonna draw a wall here, just like this, okay? And attached to that wall, I'm going to have a spring, right? And attached to the spring, I'm going to have a mass of uh, m kilograms. Now this um, spring, is has a certain stiffness and so we said that it has a spring constant associated with it we call it k the higher the value of k the stiffer the spring the lower the value of k the uh, weaker the spring and you know that the value of k is going to determine how this thing moves i mean just from everyday experience so we're not going to nail down what k is actually going to be but we're just going to label it k it can be any number that's going to yield different um, stiffnesses for that spring all right so just to make sure everybody's on the same page this is called the spring constant, right? Right, and this is the mass of the block. Now, one more thing I want to point out to you here is, is in the rest position, like we, we put this thing together, we put it on the table. You have to imagine this thing sort of sitting on a table. I'm not going to draw that here, but it's, it's sitting on a table right here. Now, the natural rest position of this spring, we're going to call it L. And you have to use your imagination. Just think about any old spring. If you leave it alone, it's going to naturally expand to some normal position. If you push on it or pull on it from that natural rest position, it's going to push back on you. But if you just set it aside, it has a natural length L. So that's what we're going to draw here. All right, so this is the rest position. Now let's go ahead and pretend to pull this spring back a little bit. So let me draw that again. Here is another little illustration. And so here, we've pulled the spring back, so I'm going to actually kind of draw the coil pulled back a little bit, but it's still connected to the same mass, M. And of course, just because we pull it doesn't really mean anything's changed with the spring. It still has the same spring constant. Okay, it's the same spring. We haven't done anything else other than pull it back. But notice that once we do this, this uh, natural position, L, I'm just going to draw a little dotted line right here. That is still this distance here. Of course, we've pulled it back, so we've stretched it out. And the distance that we have pulled it beyond its rest position, I'm going to change colors for that, we're going to call this x. So this is a snapshot in time, right? You have to think of this as sort of a freeze frame uh, moment. So we pull this guy back to this distance, which is x meters beyond its it's an original rest position. And at that moment, we basically let this thing go. So when we start this little experiment, yeah, we have to pull it back and all, but we start our stopwatch, we start our camera, we start our experiment, however you want to think about it, at the moment that we let this block go. So T0 is the moment that we let this block go. So right at the beginning of our experiment, X is way over here. But of course, as time goes on, the spring is going to pull the mass back 
it's going to overshoot past its equilibrium position. It's going to get compressed over here. So it's going to get compressed spring here. The, press, the spring will push it back and it will go back and forth. So what we really want to find ultimately when we write a differential equation is we, we really know that x is going to be a function of time. So really what I'm going to put here, this is really x of t because this is a snapshot that I've drawn it, but as time marches on, x will change. Here, x will be positive, right? Here, x will be positive, and over here, x will be negative. So let me go ahead and write that and try to use a different color here. So I'm going to put, just to remind you, all of these uh, distances, anytime we're on this side of the equilibrium position, we're going to say that this is x is positive. Right? And it's by, just by convention. You have to choose something. And then over on this side, when we compress the spring, when the, the mass overshoots this direction, we're going to say that x is negative. So we know that x of t, which is the position of this guy, is going to oscillate. It's going to go positive, negative, positive, negative. Eventually, it's going to stop because this system's not going to go forever. Friction's going to slow it down. But, you know, if it were a perfect spring with no losses, if it were in space with no friction, you know, if there was absolutely no losses anywhere, then yeah, it would oscillate forever. Of course, it's never going to happen. All right, so let's analyze this and look and see what we actually have. Let me draw a little bit of a, a divider. This is the conceptual part. Now let's get into the math a little bit. What is um, the force of this spring? What force is this spring actually acting on the block? Now you might remember from physics, the force on the mass from the spring is, uh, that's called Hooke's Law, you may remember that, it's F on the mass is equal to negative K times X. So this is why the spring constant's important. Basically, K governs the spring constant, so the higher the spring constant is, the larger it is, the more force is going to act on that mass. The lower the spring constant, the less force is going to act on that mass. Now, it's proportional to how far in X I've pulled away. In other words, if I pull the block, or if, if, the, if the block overshoots and gets farther away, X is going to get bigger, so the force pulling it back is going to be larger. Which brings me to the next, uh, the next part of this. Why is this negative sign here? You know, my advice in differential equations is you really do, especially when you're reading your book and following my lectures, you really do need to try to understand all these little details. A lot of times a book will put a negative sign in for a force and a lot of students won't consider it or think about it, but you really need to understand where all that's coming from so that you understand what you're doing. And so the negative sign here, when you think about it, what this is basically saying is since we've divided our, our world up into positive x and negative x, if I pull the block in positive x over here, how I have it drawn here, what direction is the force on the uh, block going to be from the spring? Well, the spring is going to pull it back this way. So the force from the spring is going to be acting completely opposite to the distance I have pulled it since we're talking about positive x. Positive x, negative force because they're opposite directions. So you, you have to have a negative sign here to show that in terms of sign. If I if I didn't have a negative sign here, then it would be implying the force of the spring would be pushing the block farther that way, the farther I pull the, the block. And likewise, when I come into compression, if I push the block this way, I'm in negative x, but the force of the spring is pushing me this way, which is a positive sense. So we have to have this negative sign in there to, to take care of that. All right, the next thing we need to do is recall uh, Newton's law, right? which you all should know, Newton's Law of Motion, F is equal to MA, right? Which we talked about a little bit in the last course. This acceleration, even though we think about it in physics as this uh, linear term, it's really a second derivative of position. Um, you know, you have position x of t, you take the derivative of that, you get velocity. You take the derivative again, you get acceleration. So really what this is, is if you really look at Newton's Law, it can be written alternatively as m uh, d uh, squared x d t squared. Second derivative of position. All right. So what we have done is we've sort of analyzed all of the forces acting on this block. The only force that we really have acting on it is the spring force. We're not assuming any friction. We're not assuming uh, any wind. 
We're not assuming anything like that. We're just saying, okay, this guy has a force on the block proportional to its distance in the spring constant. That's this force. We also know that whatever force acts on this block is equal to the mass of the block times the acceleration. That's going to govern its motion. If you push on the block, it has a certain mass, it's going to accelerate a certain way. All right? We bust this out into a second derivative. So what we need to do next is put these two things together because this is the force on the block and this is the force on the block, so we equate them. So what we're going to get is when we plug in F over here, or I should say over here, you'll get negative K times X is equal to M D squared X D T squared, right? Now let's go ahead and this is the differential equation that we're, they're hunting for, but let's go ahead and just rearrange it and move everything over to one side, right, and see what we get. So when we rearrange it, we're going to have m d squared x d t squared. We'll move the kx over here by adding it, plus kx equals 0, because we've subtracted it. So that's what I want to circle here, right here. And that's really the motivation for the section to show you a real-world system. So this is a block. Uh, attached to a spring with a certain spring constant A. The only constants that matter in this entire problem is the spring constant and the mass of the block. Everything else is just Newton's law of motion that really falls out of F is equal to MA. And we have only one and only one force acting on the block. So this is this term here. And notice that um, that this equation, because we're not pushing on the block, you know, we're pulling on it and we're letting it go, right? At that moment, the system is just reacting. There's no more forcing. In other words, my hand is not attached to the block inputting additional uh, input force into the, into the block, in other words. This is what we call an undriven system. In other words, this differential equation, because it's homogeneous like this, we call it homogeneous when, we, when, when the time function, the, uh, the external forcing function is equal to zero, basically is uh, going to describe the behavior of the system with no, no external forcing functions. If I had a mechanical arm hooked up to this block, constantly giving it input forces you know, from an external source, then I would have another source term on the other side that would be you know, pushing that guy, and, and the differential equation would be set up to reflect that. But this guy is really a response type of equation. I've got some constants. I, the system is set up the way it's set up, we start it off, but then after that, everything is governed by how the system reacts, right? Um, and so that's, that's what this differential equation is going to show you. Now, let's turn our attention to altering this system just a little bit and coming up with a, a differential equation that isn't quite as simple that you're not going to be able to just integrate if you get the answer. So let's go and do that. And what we're going to do quickly here is um, redraw the system. So this is system number two, I guess you might say. Right? Uh, let's go ahead and draw it with our, you know, natural position spring attached to a block, mass m. Uh, this spring again has a constant k. Right? Now, instead of this being the system, which is what we had last time, on the other side of this mass m, we're going to attach it to kind of like a reservoir. Uh, you can sort of think of this as like a little piston in here. So this I'm going to color it in. It's like a solid little piston. And inside of this, you know, thing here is, is like oil, something really thick, syrup or something like that. So what you've got going on here is, yeah, it's able to oscillate, but this mass is physically attached, like with a metal stainless steel rod or something, to this guy. And it's moving around in this really thick, viscous liquid. So when the spring tries to push it, yeah, it's able to push it, but it's pushing against this thick, sludgy liquid. All right. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to draw this again, just to sort of think about it, when the spring is a little bit more expanded, I'll go ahead and put the mass right here, then it's going to be just a little bit closer. And of course, my piston's a little bit farther in because of that. Still got a spring constant K and filled with the liquid. So you see it's kind of, as it's moving, it's kind of pushing back and forth against the sludgy oil stuff. Okay, so what are the forces acting on this guy? All right, well, we still have the spring constant. Forget about the oil for a second. The forces acting on this block, we still have, um, we still have spring force. 
which is F is equal to negative KX, right? Uh, we still have that force uh, because that hasn't changed. As if you notice this guy right here, I didn't really draw it this time, but this is the equilibrium position L, and then this guy is you know, position x. So as it goes back and forth, x of t is gonna, gonna change. This is positive x, this is negative x. Just the same thing as before, no difference. The only thing we've done is add this. We still have the spring force. But we have another force acting on this guy because of the viscous liquid here. So let's look at this guy. This is going to be called the, um, I'm gonna call this the viscous force. Or you could call it the dampening force, because really that's what it is. It's dampening. So what you have here is F. Let me go ahead and change colors here. No, I think this is fine. F is equal to negative B times dx dt. This is the force on the mass from the oil. Now, think about this. This guy, this B here, this is called dampening coefficient. Damping coefficient. Okay, and what the same thing as before. If B is higher, then the force from that oil is going to be higher. So oil or syrup would have a much higher B than water, let's say, or air. If it was filled with air, B would be very small because it wouldn't have much force acting on it. All right. Notice this force is not proportional to X like the spring force. That's because it, when you pull a spring, the force is, as you pull it, it's proportional to how far you pull it. That's why X is here. The viscous force is not proportional to how far the spring is pulled or how far it's moved. It's proportional to how fast the spring is moving through the liquid. And that makes physical sense. I mean, if you have oil and you push it really slowly through the oil, like maybe like takes you a whole day to move through the oil, then the oil's not going to present that much of a force pushing against it. But if you try to ram it through really fast, then that thick sludgy liquid is going to push back really fast because it's proportional to how fast I'm, put, I'm moving through it. That's why we have dx dt because x is my distance, dx dt is the velocity of this block. All right, And of course b making it higher makes a higher force also. It's negative for the same reason this one's negative because if I'm pushing this way, this is positive sense. If I'm dx dt, if it's moving this direction, if the velocity is positive, then the damping force is pushing in the opposite direction, so I need a negative sign. If the block is moving this way, then my velocity is negative, but the damping force is always going to act opposite. So basically these guys are always going to have negative signs because the force is always opposite uh, the direction you're moving or the direction you are. All right. Now that we have those two pieces of information, we're ready to rock and roll with the differential equation. So we know, again, that F is equal to MA, which is just equal to M times D, um, DX squared, D squared X, DT squared. So second derivative of position, same as before. Now, let's plug in what we know. This is F is equal to MA. This force that we use when Newton's law has to be the sum of all of the forces acting on the block. You know, if the, if the spring were vertical, you would have to take gravity into account here. But we're, we're presuming there's no gravity here. We're not presuming anything. No friction on the table. We're just looking at the system with these forces. If it were vertical, you'd have to deal with gravity also. So this F is the sum of all forces acting on the, on the block. So we have negative KX, right? We also have this damping force, negative B dx dt. And that's equal to, because this is the sum of the forces, that's equal to m d squared x dt squared. Right? So that's a differential equation. Now, just for, you know, to make a comparison, let's move all this stuff to the other side. So we'll have is m d squared x dt squared. Moving this term over, we'll have plus b dx dt, just moving that guy over, plus, now we'll move this guy over, kx, and that's equal to zero. So, let's circle this, and this is the second differential equation that we've sort of derived here, right? Now look at this. This is also a second order differential equation because the highest derivative is second derivative. However, this guy is more complicated because not only do we have a second order differential, a second derivative here, we also have a first derivative, right? 
and then we have this constant term here. So really, when you look at it, the difference between this and this really is just the center term that's popped up. And the only reason that center term popped up at all is because we changed the problem. We stuck it in a viscous liquid. There's an additional force there, right? So this is another homogeneous equation. There's no external forcing function pushing on it. I don't have this block hooked up to a mechanical ram that's trying to, to move it, you know, um, at 60 times a second or, or back and forth or anything like that. It's just we pull it back, we let it go. The system is defined by my drawing. The system has a force from this and a force from this. And what we're, this differential equation really describes is the response of the system. Right? So we were going to learn techniques in this course to solve these kinds of differential equations. Now notice that this is not going to be able to be solved by integration. Now, what I want to do finally is culminate here by taking this exact system, right, and changing it just a little bit more. And I've tried to allude to this, uh, but, you know, I don't want to give everything away. So let's say we now have another system. I'll draw it stretched out this time. Right? Here's block of mass M. All right. Let's say this guy was its natural position, the natural position of the spring, and so it's, it's already stretched out um, X meters beyond that. Now let's change it a little bit because I'm going to add something. Instead of putting the oil over here, I'm going to put the oil down below, but it's exactly the same force involved. I can, I can create like a you know, a big paddle in here or something. And this is like a stainless steel rod or something like that. And the oil is in here, some kind of thick viscous liquid. So as it moves, it's doing the same thing. I'm just drawing it down below because I'm trying to make room over here for something else. But as the block moves, I'm getting a viscous force. It's sort of irrelevant that it's down below. Now let's say, in addition to this, I've got, you know, I'm just going to draw it as an arrow. I've got some external force E of T acting on this block. So I'm going to call this external force. And you can think of E for external. So this is the exact same system that we had before. It's the only difference is that I've got some force in newtons as a function of time pushing on the block. So this is a little bit more complicated because I've pulled the block back. Yes, I've pulled it back here. But instead of just letting it go, I've got an actual function, a force pushing on it at a certain frequency or whatever. This could be, E of T could be cosine of omega T. That means um, cyclic cosine function. You know, a mechanical ram pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling, right? Well, obviously, all of the forces are still going to act on the block. You're still going to have the spring force, K of, you know, negative Kx, right, acting on this, no matter if I'm pushing or not. You're still going to have the damping force, which is going to be proportional to how fast the block is moving. But you're also going to have this other force that I'm adding into the system. So how does the differential equation respond to that? Right? Well, what you're going to have is the spring force, negative kx, right? Whoops. We'll say f is equal to negative kx. Uh, that's from the spring. Now we also have negative, negative b dx dt. This is from the oil, right? And now we have another force is equal to e of t. That's the external force. There's no negative here because, uh, you know, it's just pointing in the direction it's pointing. In other words, this force I'm adding is not really proportional to where the spring is. I mean, it's this, these forces are reactionary forces. They're dependent upon e, what the spring is doing, where the mass is, how fast it's moving. E of t is completely decoupled from the system. It has nothing to do with what the system is doing. It's just an external, it's like having a toddler holding the block and just ramming it. It's totally independent of what the, the system is doing. It's just an external function. So there's no negative sign here. E of t is whatever it is. Cosine, sine, could be a step function that's constant. It could be anything. All right. So let's go ahead and craft this differential equation, and you can kind of guess what's going to happen. You're going to have f is equal to ma, which is equal to m d uh, squared x dt squared. So what we want to do is add these guys in here. F, 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 and f. These are all the forces acting on this block. They all have to sum in here. So we have negative kx minus b dx dt plus e of t, adding all these together, that's this f, 
equals this guy on the right, m d squared x dt squared. Now, just to compare apples to apples, we'll move these guys over here, rearrange a little bit. This is going to be my leading term, so I'm going to say m d squared x dt squared. Let's move this term over by adding it plus b dx dt plus this guy, we'll move it over, uh, kx is equal to, and we're going to leave this on the other side, e of t. I could move it over and set it equal to zero, but traditionally when we write these differential equations, if we have a pure function of time, we leave it on the other side of the equal sign by itself. And this is sort of how you would see it written in a textbook. md, uh, second derivative of x, plus b, first derivative of x, plus kx is equal to e of t. Now, what is the difference between this and the previous one? Look at this guy. This is exactly the same differential equation right here, right? Except over here, I've got my forcing function on the other side, right? So that's the only difference, and that makes sense because the only thing we've changed is really added this external force that I'm adding to it here, right? So this is what a differential equation would look like, and this part of the equation on the left-hand side of the equal sign describes the system. These are all terms that are coming about because of the way the system's put together. F is equal to ma is always in play. The spring constant's in play. The damping coefficient's in play. If you had it hung vertically, gravity would come into play. If you had it in space subject to solar flares, the solar flare force would come into play on that side. If you had, uh, you know, some kind of a sh you know, shear force or something like that, anything, whatever force would be acting on this system that's a reactionary type of thing that's not an external thing would be coming about over here. All the other forces that are uh, uh, coming into this guy just kind of acting as a sort of external forcing function are going to be on the other side of the equal sign here, right? All right, so this is a, yet a more complicated differential equation. Now the, the punchline that I'm bringing home here, that I want to bring home here, is that when we study these things, and notice you can't integrate this, this is even more complicated than the other one, you're not going to be able to just do two integrations and get the answer here. But what we're going to learn, I'm going to give you a little bit of a foreshadowing, right, so that as we go in the next few sections, you won't be uh, surprised by what we end up saying. What we're going to do when we have a system that has a parts of the equation that are governed by the system, and then we have an external function, forcing function like this, what we're going to do is similar to what we sort of did in previous problems in the last volume of differential equations. We're going to first eliminate the source from the differential equation. We're going to put a zero in here and make it homogeneous, right? We do that so that we can solve the differential equation in the absence of any external forces, just seeing what the system response is, just because we built it that certain way, right? With those certain components, with a certain mass, with a certain spring, we're going to get the solution to see how it behaves just because we built it that way. And then we're going to come back and add in the fact that we have an external force and put those two solutions together, then we're going to have the total solution. I want to say that one more time because it's really important and we're going to go into it as, as, as soon as even the next section from now we're going to start talking about that a little bit more. When we have a non-homogeneous equation like we have here, usually our strategy is going to be to take the forcing function source out of the equation altogether and solve the resulting equation using the techniques that we'll talk about. Okay, We're going to get that answer, but that's not going to be the answer to the whole problem. That's only going to describe what this, this, the uh, system is going to do um, you know, without, in the absence of an external input uh, force. And then after that, we get that solution, then we're going to use a technique to bring back the initial source, see how that influences the answer. We're going to put those two things together into one mega solution, if you want to call it that way, or call it, call it that, and then that's going to be the full answer to that, right? It's kind of analogous. We've been talking about springs and stuff here, and that's great for the mechanical guys out there, but just one more example. It's kind of analogous to uh, a circuit. Right? You can build a circuit and choose components. You can choose a value of a capacitor, you can choose a value of a resistor, you can choose a value of the inductor. You can construct it in a certain way and you can write a differential equation that's just going to govern what that's, how that circuit's going to react to like a pulse of current, an instantaneous like pulse of current. That would be the system response right, to a single input impulse. Right? Uh, that would be like the, almost like the homogeneous version, just seeing what the system's going to do. Then we hook a source up to it, a voltage source, right? Like maybe a sine wave or maybe your wall outlet 
your wall that you know comes out with a sine wave right out of the wall. That's like the forcing function, right? We hook that current up, that power source, to the circuit. Now we have the system, which is governed by the components, right? And then we also have the source that we've hooked in that's constantly driving the thing. And the final solution is sort of going to be a combination of the two. It's definitely going to depend on the source, but it's also going to depend upon the components and how we built the thing. So it's exactly analogous to what we have here. And that's what you're going to see over and over in differential equations. You'll usually have an input uh, uh, forcing function is what I like to call it because it, it creates a mental image of, 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 for me that really works. But some function of time that's independent of everything else that's sending stuff into the system. It's very typical to, to sort of dissociate those two, look at how the system responds with a homogeneous version, and then come back in with the, uh, you know, with the particular solution when we come back in there. Same kind of technique is going to be applied to higher order differential equations. I chose a spring system because it's easy to grasp. That yields a second order system. But there's lots of systems out there that may be third order or fourth order. We're going to use similar techniques uh, to solve those. So I hope you've learned something in this section. We didn't actually solve a whole problem. The point of this section here was really to give you more than motivation. I wanted to motivate you, but I wanted to also show you where this can really come from and how very easily you could get into a, an equation that totally makes sense in real life that would yield a term that would make it much harder to solve. So you get a little motivation to kind of get a little excited, if you want to call it that, so that when we look at these problems, in the remainder of the course, and we solve equation after equation after equation, you kind of have an idea about how they could possibly arise. Um, Jason, I hope this gives you a little bit of foundation. Stick with me in the following sections. We'll take it one step at a time and uh, conquer our solution methods of differential equations of higher order.